that. Thanks, Tori. So now that we've started the recording, um, I can welcome everybody again formally. I'm Tamsin. I'm a managing consultant within the consulting division of GB Partnerships. Um, so I'll be facilitating today, but Ian, my colleague, will be doing the heavy lifting as it's his area of expertise. So just to note, today is all about information sharing. I know we get the opportunity to pick Ian's brains, but please do pop questions. Um, it is about learning. We want to learn from each other as well, not just learning from Ian. So please don't be shy. Um, if I could ask, if you pop your questions into the chat, I'll keep an eye on them. Um, if it's pertinent to stop Ian, I'll interrupt and get him to answer your question at that point. But I anticipate most of the questions we'll, we'll hold off to the end. If anybody has a question um, that you would rather not have associated with you for the recording purposes, please feel free to send it to me by email um, and then I'll raise it without associating um, your name at all. And then, as always, the questions don't need to end with this session. If you have questions that occur to you after we've wrapped up, please don't hesitate. You can send me an email or you can send Ian an email. So um, without further ado, let me give you a bit of an overview of who, who Ian is. Uh, Ian is a chartered property professional. Uh, he's worked in most property sectors over the last 20 years. He started his career as a professional practice quantity surveyor with experience in all the procurement routes, but also specialised in some of the NHS lift buildings, um, which is where I think most of your recent experience has been with GB Partnerships, Ian. And Ian is currently our development director, so he's he's well placed to share his, his learnings from this. So thank you, Ian. Over to you. Brilliant. Thanks, Tamsin. Um, it's interesting, isn't it, when somebody else reads your bio back to you, you, you go, hmm, A, I need to update it because I think scarily it's actually 30 years now. Um, but uh, yeah, so so welcome, everybody. So yeah, as, as um, Tamsin said, yeah, Development Director at GB Partnerships, um, been here for I think about nine years, um, but doing primary care for um, 20 years in, in the development sphere. So um, if you can just flick on one um, slide for me, Jane. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. So, in, I think in terms of um, in terms of what I want to try and cover today, um, it was, it's obviously a look at the sort of development sphere in, term, in, in terms of primary and community care. Um, I, I want to cover the, the sort of current backdrop as to sort of as I see it, um, what what's going on in the marketplace. We you know, are where, where we are in, as a country in terms of um, development and and the, and the challenges. Um, talk through the sort of development process itself, um, and then look at the barriers that I see. Um, with with the with the the process, and then obviously you know, the the main focus is is around how can we remove and reduce those barriers, and then obviously leave you with some takeaways hopefully from today, as to how to to move forward. So, um, that, that's that's what I want to achieve. So in terms of um a business, um just give you a little two minutes on on the on the business itself. Um so GB Partnerships um is a is a multifaceted company. Um we've got three main divisions. Uh we've got a consult division which um is the early stage. Uh, so effectively working with NHS um, NHS bodies, uh, ICBs, trusts, councils as well, um, looking at strategic estates planning, um, doing business case authoring, um, looking at their existing portfolio of property and how, how best to um, change them, improve them um, and move things forward. Then that comes on to, to ourselves um, and, and the division I look after, the development division. So we are effectively pro property developers, uh, work nationally across the country, um, we've done schemes down as far south as Dartmouth and, and we're delivering stuff um, up through Liverpool and, th and through the north um, and if effectively um, building building new property. But also we have a project management division that helps NHS parts of the NHS, NHS with variations of their existing portfolio and does sort of turnkey developments for them where they're funded directly by the NHS. And then on to our management division. So this is um, an estates management team that look after a portfolio of about 80 um, health centres across England and Scotland, um, doing all of these sort of estates management, looking after the portfolio, managing the FM, etc. So we kind of everything from an idea and our consult team right the way through to managing the, the estate once it's once it's complete. And then um, I've put an image there of um, Starport Health Centre. It's one of our more recent ones. I thought it was worth just just sort of mentioning it. Really, it's um it, it it's. I think for us a bit of a success in the sense that um, if ever there was a difficult project, I think this was probably it. So we we tendered it pre-pandemic, um, then we built it during the pandemic, which comes with its own challenges. 
Um, sadly, um, the contractor, who was 125 years old, went bust halfway through the construction, um, so which is a, obviously a massive challenge, and obviously to finish it and have have people standing um, outside of it at the end, and it's been trading for about a year now, is um, definitely what we see as one of our success stories, and that, that lovely image that was, if you were here at the start of the the lady cutting the ribbon was was from this centre as well, so um, just thought that one was worth a mention. Okay, um, thank you. So I think current backdrop, um, this this I think is is the crux to what are the challenges, and I thought it's worth me sort of pulling out a few points as to where we see ourselves. So I, th I think you know first of all, you know, these some of these um, quotes were taken from Health Sector Journal and, and other um, publications. And yeah, the, the couple of the ones on the screen there, Norfolk and Waveney, facing challenges with rental valuations for new build premises, not much in it, developer expectations, um, Coventry ICB, um, rebuilds in its area, high risk because of significant inflation in construction and lending markets, and you know, others that you know, I've seen, I've got one here, Greater Manchester said it's been forced to put on hold any estates developments, and um, despite concern there is insufficient space in general practice. Um, and it may result in the inability to deliver the core and additional services required. So some some you know major challenges that are recognised you know at ICB level um, and at NHS level. And I guess you know that filters down through the development process to ourselves. And obviously it's up to us to try and find ways to to deliver those schemes. So um, I think one one of the sort of major major issues that's happened of recent times is bill costing increases. So um, you know we've seen 30% increase in costs pretty much. You know. And that's been a combination of COVID, it's been Brexit, we've had a Ukraine war, um, HS2 has sucked up resource, and now obviously even things like you know Houthi rebels bombing shipping from you know materials moving around. So we've got this kind of stacking effect that's, that's pushed our bill costs up by sort of 30 percent. On the flip to that, you know, the investment market. So in terms of you know w w when we deliver a building, you know, we fund it, we tend to um, sell it to the investment market. Investment yields have fallen so um, or have softened so. Um, what that means is that the, you know, for the same rent, um, the, the value um, that we can command from the investment market has fallen. So we're getting squeezed at both sides. The cost of building a scheme has got more and the value that, that we generate from, from that rent um, has, has come down. And if you take an example of the Starport scheme again, you know, the, a shift of you know, from say 4.5% yield to the 5% yield that we're probably seeing now in the market would reduce the value of that building by a million pounds. So by doing nothing any different, just just the changes in market conditions. And, and a lot of that's down to the things like the government guilt rate. Um, the government guilt sat very low for a long time. Um, so it was it was there as an investment opportunity and it was kind of you know, when your pension firms um, sp were spreading their risk, they'd buy a little bit of guilt. So now guilts are up at four and a half, five percent. Well, why would investors you know come and do a, a property development and only make four percent when they can go and buy a, a government guilt and make make a bigger return on that? So that's a challenge. Um, other things that we've seen um, is um, district valuers. You know, the, the, there's there's the sort of CMR rental levels just haven't moved that much recently. Um, it's been very flat, and and the reason for that is that the investment market has been improving up until recently, and it, that's kind of flattened out. Um, that the requirement for rents to increase. So effectively, investors have paid more for the same product, and um, that's that's meant that rents have stayed very static. The difficulty we've got now, though, is that you know with this, with the switch in investment markets um, and and a switch in um, bill cost increases, that that's no longer possible. Um, I think that's probably in terms of the backdrop to the market. I think I'll, I'll just um, run through to the sort of development process now. Um, so. What I've set out here is is, is um, a typical development process. So, uh, you know, I won't read these out to you, but effectively, you know, engaging stakeholders and, and setting up a steering group, um, and then running through to a brief site option study, business case, heads of terms, and then on from number seven um, is effectively the build process. So, design team, planning permission, um, and through to construction. Now. The box that I've put around is three, four, five, and six. Very much, I think the sort of barriers to getting the scheme to be delivered um, sit in in those three boxes. So it's all about, you know, when you've got a project, you know, can you find a site? Once you've got a site and, and you know what you're building, um, can you make a business case that's affordable for the system? And then, you know, have you got a legal structure um, and have you got heads of terms with a legal structure that everyone's signed up to that gives you a, de a developable scheme? I think ironically, yeah, once we've done all of that, you know, once we're getting through to designing the actual building, that's probably the easy bit for us. I think you know, it's 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 um, you know, 
sticking the bricks together is actually easy. It, it's you know, from my experience of, of healthcare development, it's that it's the sort of 12 to 18 months of trying to you know, get the scheme up and running. Um, is definitely a challenge, and it's and it's really those sort of um, four boxes there that I'm going to focus the rest of the webinar on. So Jane, if you can run through, thank you. So I've split the I've split the um what I see as the barriers um into a, a number of headings, and I, I thought I'd run through them um with you. Um, so ICB and GP rental service charge. Yeah, you know, as we've said, the NHS um is pretty broke. Um, you know, all the all the um. All the press that we're seeing um, is telling us that, and you know, I'm talking to ICBs up and down the country, and and uh, everyone's struggling with rental affordability. For those that um, may not be aware, GPs in this country um, get their rent reimbursed to them. So when so when GPs come to me and say, Ian, can you help me deliver a new scheme? The first thing we do is work out well what size will it be, what's what's the rent likely to be. But then very quickly we go we go on and talk to the ICBs about whether they support it in principle and whether they can afford the rent. Um, because the GPs get their rent reimbursed to them. So um, building size, um, effectively, you know, the challenge we have is when people move out of an old building into a new building, they the building gets bigger. Now, obviously, you know, it gets bigger because they want more space, and that's absolutely right. Um, but you know, what people don't realise is it gets bigger for lots of other reasons. So typically GPs are in you know, either old clinic buildings from the 80s, they're in converted houses and things like that. So when they move, um, that you know, it, they can be, they can, buildings can grow for um, reasons, not just because they want more rooms, so that to, get to achieve building regulation compliance, corridors get wider um, to achieve HTM and HBN compliance. Um, you, you probably end up with more toilets, with dirty utilities, with um, interview rooms. And then we've had um, issues recently with things like COVID, where obviously we have to now consider um, the impacts of COVID and the sort of design side of things. So you have you know, multiple entrances with hot zones to deal with pandemics so you can separate patients. Um, and that's all before you know, the GPs get the extra rooms they need or the community services get the extra rooms they need. Um, obviously, there's a there's a big push and it's absolutely right to try and bring multiple services into buildings so multiple providers delivering um so you've got community services or gps as well or multiple gp practices again when you when you bring those into buildings you've got to join them up so the actual um corridor and circulation space joining them up so we're ending up you know trying to move people out of old buildings into new buildings that have got bigger not just because of the additional clinical space but because of a number of reasons as well and obviously that adds to the costs so um ours and pcn services so for those that don't know ours additional reimbursable roles scheme so that's around um, giving gps access to additional services from clinicians be it pharmacists physiotherapists and the like um, but with those services where do they where do we locate them um, typically they've kind of um, kind of squatted i guess in the existing gp surgery spaces but again when we build new services new surgeries rather and new buildings we need to provide that space again more space equals more cost equals more rent and at the moment that is causing a challenge uh cdel um for those that haven't come across that so cdel is um it stands for a uh, capital departmental expenditure limit and essentially it's a it's um an accounting piece um so all leases now that are let to nhs bodies so be that a trust um or uh nhs property services or um chp or a, 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 an nhs body will they have um, a limit on how much they can spend on capital development during the year and leases now count towards that that expenditure limit so when they sign a lease that the amount of that rent gets capitalized and it's now no longer just can you afford the rent it's have you got the balance sheet cover to put that um, on on the scheme and we're definitely seeing schemes that, that have slowed down because trusts and the like um, don't have the CDL cover and they're sort of saying well actually we're not sure how much we're going to get next year and whether we can get, move, go forward so it's definitely a barrier and we will look at ways of of dealing with that um so community services and apms lease length so Back, back, you know, in the in, the, in my earlier years of um, primary care development, PCTs um, would take leases for the space. ICBs can't um, at the moment. Would I'll come on to that a little bit later? But effectively, then, so some of the services that are delivered from primary care centres, and some GPs that have an APMS, which is a, a limited five to seven year contract, 
well, we need to look at how, how do they come into a new building where we need 25 year leases? So definitely something that we need to look at and I'll come on to that a little bit later. And, and getting those leases to be fundable. Yeah, I think if you, you know, people talk to us about, can we have break clause? You know, could we just have a break clause at the end of that APMS contract? And the answer is not easily, because it's not easily fundable, because effectively when we're taking, going to the markets and saying, how do you, you know, can, do you want to buy this uh, product? Um, I mean, I want you to give me top dollar so that I can keep the rents low. They need to know they've got security of that lease. And that's, that's why um, we've got low yields in health versus things like retail. Um, we're demanding more for the product because it is an NHS product. Um, existing premises ties. This is something we're seeing with, um, I think, with GPs. Obviously, you know, moving out of existing premises. You know, are they? Uh, do they own it and they need to sell it? Um, have they got um, outstanding debt against the building that they're concerned about? Are they tied to um, existing leases with other other landlords, um, etc.? So again, I'll touch on that a little bit later in terms of the. Um, the solutions for that and then estates expertise i think you know i've certainly seen a, a change um over the last 20 years i think pct in pct days you know you had estates functions um, commissioning functions all under one roof then obviously our nhs changed and we created ccgs and nhs property services and and that got separated and i think in terms of you know bringing schemes forward quickly i think certain certain sectors of the ICBs um, have more or less estates expertise and I think it's, it's definitely um, a challenge in terms of um, trying to get things to move quickly. We we offer um, various um, embedded roles so I think you know lots, lots of ICBs are seeing that they need assistance and are reaching out to companies like us which is, which is very welcome but certainly I see that as one of the barriers that, that uh, is worth um, looking at in a little bit more detail. And then land cost availability and acquisition. Um, as ever, you know, probably my two challenges with healthcare development is you know, GPs, trusts say, can you deliver us a new scheme? You look at where they want to be and you know, can you find a spare acre, acre and a half that hasn't already been snapped up for um, for residential use or other use? And then so we've got to find the land and then we've got to acquire it and compete with those other uses. I guess the more we pay for um, healthcare land, it, you know, in terms of our appraisal, the more we have to charge in terms of rent and we're back up to the top of this list, which is can the system afford it? So looking at how we can do that um, and how we can secure the land and and kind of speed of decision making, I've highlighted there as a barrier, you know, that again, some of that is linked to land, um, you know, to, to if you find a site, well, how quickly can we acquire it? We can only acquire it really once we've got certainty that the scheme will move forward. And you know, given the the process, you know, I typically suggest that it's probably a 12 to 18 month process to run through um, a, de a development just to get to site. So, and 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 you know, a lot of that um, is about business case approval. Tomorrow. Um, sorry, I've got a bit of interference. Okay, sorry. Um, okay, so I, I think yeah, those are those. I mean, are those for me are the the main barriers to 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 bring in schemes forward. Um, if we can run to the next slide, Jane, I'll. So what I've tried to do is lump in um, the, the the different barriers that we've got into into three categories, um, you know, the financial ones, the legal ones, and then I've um, imaginatively um, chucked everything else in a, in a nice block called other because I couldn't think of anything else. Uh, so if we, if we, you know, I think I tackle financial first. I think that's probably the main, the main, um, Areas. Um, so, size of facilities. As I, as I've mentioned, you know, buildings get bigger um, because we want them to. Absolutely, we want to deliver more services, so we want more space. They they get bigger um, because of all of the regulatory um, constraints that we've got to deliver to. So, for me, you know, the the experience I've I've had is, you know, back in the early you know part of um, the two thousands. We were trying to build expansion space. We were, um, I guess, pushing the margins in terms of how much space could could GPs justify, and you know, can we work a bit of that in to allow for expansion? And absolutely, we've got to do that. I think that the focus now, though, is about not overdoing it. I think it's about making sure that they've absolutely got that critical clinical space that they need. It's about us properly looking at business cases um, in terms of looking at the residential development that's going on nearby working out what that patient list size growth is and making sure that they've absolutely got that growth in there, but not overdoing it. I think one of the really important things is, is around shared space. 
Um, there's obviously the healthcare at scale agenda has been pushed um, rightly so, and we've done some amazing schemes where we've got multiple GPs, trusts, um, you know, community providers working all out of the same building. But sharing facilities, and yeah, you know, th that doesn't necessarily have to mean um, you know sharing the the back office spaces where you need privacy and um, and um, confidentiality, but definitely looking at you know sharing. Um, both clinical spaces in terms of things like group rooms, um, minor ops rooms, and I think there's huge benefits to practices. Practices often worry about coming together in one building, but I think there's huge benefits. If you've got a, a room that you'd, you'd use twice a week, then you know, previously if you sat in a building on your own, you'd never be able to justify that. If there's three of you who would use it twice a week, well, there we are. You've got you know, six days worth that you're using out of five and it's been used you know, wholly. And I think it's really important that we, we, we look at the size and more importantly, what's in that space and how well it's shared to make sure we we we, we deliver in buildings now that are going to be fully utilised and, and make sure and that doesn't mean just it's demise to a party and it's theirs on a lease. It means it's actually used um, and and therefore if they if they do need potentially some additional clinical space, then maybe to put that in bookable rooms. Um, and how how do we how do we do it so that everyone's got access to stuff and it's not kind of got names on doors. Um, so design to cost, I don't know if there's any architects, I think there was a few who signed up, so sorry about this one, um, if there is any architects here. I think um, it's it's back to the same point in, the, in that we, we're constrained by um, the, the, you know, the finances of the NHS and it's it's right for us to deliver really good buildings, but not kind of overly um, overly embellished, I think, in terms. So I think you know, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of making sure we spend the money in the right places, so all around the waiting spaces, all around the sort of front of the building, etc., making sure we've got the right clinical spaces, the right, um, the, the, you know, that just not, yeah, not spending it where we don't need to spend it, and making sure that you know we're not kind of creating statement buildings all of the time, and then say to the NHS, you're just going to have to pay for that out through your rent. It, you know, we, it's you know, we, we absolutely need to deliver great stuff, and there's nothing we've delivered we're not proud of. But I think it's um, I think it's about you know making sure that we've got a really clear handle at, at an early stage. And when you think about the process, it's it's we have to kind of commit to a rent through a business case, and we're probably not building it for another. We're probably not starting to build it for at least another six months, and when we're not finishing it for another eighteen months. So we've got to make sure once we've fixed those costs that we then design to it and make sure it's deliverable, because none of us wanted to, you know, get tenders back at the end of a long design planning process and go, oh, sorry, I can't afford this thing, but thanks for everyone's time up until now. So um, certainly one that I think we need to focus on. And I guess you know, in terms of other other costs that have crept in, um, you know, as well as just natural bill cost increases through through market through the market, um, we need to, um, you know, you've got things like net zero carbon, BRIAM excellence, and all of that sort of stuff. So, um, DV value for money assessments, um, they tend to be focused on the current market rent, um, which is basically they look around the area and say, well, what's the what's the rent tone? They've just not moved um, for a long, long time, and unfortunately now they're sort of they've got their head in the sand, in my opinion, and uh, this is only you know, my opinion in terms of what the market rent is. Um, and you know you, the graph that you've got on the right hand side there, the orange line at the bottom there shows market rent growth over a period, and as you can see, it's remained incredibly flat. Um, and the other two lines are looking at both the you know, bill cost increases and assessment from PHP. Actually, this was a, this was a report that CBRE did as to where they think not just construction costs have increased, but what have health centre costs. And I guess that that gap at the top is probably things like net zero and some of the some of the specific things. So it's it's a real challenge. Um, we you know we've we've had you know when you look at when I did Starport, the the DV there was saying that. Um, you know, the rents in Starport are not as not as high as Stratford upon Avon, and therefore he wants to give me less. You know, they're probably 30 miles apart. And you know, I'm saying to the district value, the problem is I can't get a builder to drive 30 miles down the road and build it for 15% cheaper. And that's you know, it's, it's maths, unfortunately, in terms of the current market. So I think funding um, is definitely something that private sector can help with. Um, in terms of you know, how do we drive those rents down? There's, there's there's a few different ways on that. I think yeah, we've we've looked at on the traditional sort of 25 year lease product. There are funders out there who will look at things like stepped rents. So you know, it doesn't have to start a, a, an affordable position, uh, sorry, a viable position for a developer and just 
climb up from there in terms of rent reviews every three years. You know, I've definitely talked to funders who will look at sort of starting the rent lower if the current affordability for the ICB is lower. And then perhaps in year three, it steps up a little bit more. In year six, it steps up a bit more. And it's kind of balancing out um, where it makes money for the funder from year six onwards, say. Um, but for those first six years, it's it's affordable for the ICB. Um, it's certainly something I think if, if, if ICBs can reach out to us, we can look at those sort of things. Um, you, know, you could say is it kicking the can down the road a little bit i think it maybe is but also what it's allowing is it's allowing a period of time for icbs to financially plan for that rent if, you know where they need a product now but they can't quite afford it yeah we can still make things happen um income strips are something we've done recently that's um an, a product whereby um it's generally at longer leases um and the difference is whilst you, you're paying for a longer lease we can demand a much sharper investment yield and that means that the starting rent can be a lot lower and the huge benefit is that the nhs gets the ownership of the building at the end of its term so that's something we can we can look at um what else have i got um so collaboration with councils i think we've, we've looked at a number of schemes and we've delivered a couple of schemes where councils have funded them so they they can use their public works loan board monies they can push that through and they, they'll work back the rent they tend to work with specialist developers like us so you still get the expertise but you get the benefit of government funding um, and potentially at lower rates i must admit at the moment it's just still a tricky one with the um the guilt rate as high as it is but that's certainly something for the longer term grants um from a number of places so section 106 um grants can be really useful now i think you know lots of icbs and councils are demanding more from housing developers that they give money towards health you know they're creating houses and they're creating a demand i think you know we, in terms of how do you maximize that you know we can work with with icbs to help them sort of make representation to their councils um again we just need to be aware on that in terms of the timing sometimes that money um is committed by the developer but you know it doesn't come until they've built the you know the third 300th house etc so is it available now and you know how do you cash flow that so that's something we need to look at um obviously we've we've had things like ettf grants in the past they definitely help again whether the nhs will come up with others like that um but certainly can be helpful um nhs ps land sale receipts so when nhs ps sells its land um it can reinvest 50% of that value back into projects. So again, certainly something we look at if we know people are coming out of those buildings and we think NHS PS are likely to sell them, we ask them about that again, we need to look at the timing of when that money's available, is it available at the start? Um, and I think this is an important one, benefits realisation um, and measurement of them. So we, all, we write business cases and rightly so, we pick up things like, you know, this building will create reduced waiting times, it will provide a, you know, a huge wide number of additional services, it's got in, increased um, health outcomes for our patients, um, staff retention and attraction. We write that in and then often it doesn't get measured. And I think it's really important that actually that should be higher up everyone's agenda because then rather than people saying, oh yeah, that new building's great, it, it costs an extra, x you know thousand pounds in rent per year you know the whole reason we're building the building is to deliver the health outcomes and i think you know, measuring them actually people could say that that cost us 10 percent more but we've improved health outcomes by 50 percent and i think that's something we should definitely be looking to do um, and i think if, if we got those measurements and we got those better i think you know we get more robust business cases the system could make a better case for for getting the money to de deliver these schemes um, and that would definitely um, move things forward um Okay, I think that's probably good enough for finance. Let's jump on to legal. Um, so tenant status, APMS and GPMS contracts we've talk, I've talked about, yeah, where you've got a GP on a shorter term contract and where you've got service providers on shorter term contracts, how do we deal with that? That's definitely a barrier. Um, you know, we're trying to get a 25 year lease that's fundable and deliverable at, you know, at the cheapest rent for the system. But how do we do that? As I said, in the past, PCTs used to take um, leases over that space. You know, they were there, the ones commissioning those services. So they used to take a lease over the space, they commission it. And if that's to company A for seven years, then when that company's contracts up, they can commission a new company, company B from their space and off they go. Well, that, that just isn't there at the moment. So definitely a barrier. And I think, you know, how, how are we dealing with that? We're talking to um, ICBs about providing commissioning guarantees. So effectively a promise that honestly, when, when this contract's up, we'll get the next company to deliver their service from here and they can carry on paying that rent. Unfortunately, that's tricky to take to the investment market. So typically where that is the case, we, we probably need somebody like NHSPS um, to take a head lease and then they can take that guarantee themselves and then we've, we can still keep keep um, a fundable and um, investable lease um, delivered. 
and again that can be NHS PS it could be council um, we've seen a number of those where, where that's happened and then ICB leases at the moment ICBs um, are seen as quite young organizations uh, you know is, is a question of can they take leases over clinical accommodation themselves um, who knows I think you know we, I think I've heard of one case where one ICB has and I'm sure it will come and it definitely needs to come and again whether ICBs can offer an, you know a tenant of last resort kind of facility where you know if GPs want to move then if it's, it's the individual GPs who are signing up to those 25 year leases you know what happens if they're you know getting older um, and they're, they're concerned about their succession planning and they need to get another GP to take it over you know, could ICBs offer you know that tenant of last resort whereby as long as they've properly tried to to replace themselves the, the ICB would take on those leases it's something that we should be looking at I think and I think it's a potential way to get over some of the barriers around that structure um so here's my here yeah, my catch-all other um Existing premises challenges, um, GPs moving out of existing premises, you know, they often say to us, well, will you buy it? But the answer is, I might. Um, depends how good it is and where it is and what it is and, you know, is it? But, you know, it, if we do, it will come at a value and that value will be what What can I do with it? But absolutely, we can offer that. I think, that, you know, other things we can definitely do which help um, to unlock some of that is, is helping them with, um, you know, marketing that building or you know, what, what, what's it going to be? You know, could you convert it to flats? Could it, you know, often if, it's, if it was resi before, can it convert back into residential? We can help with um, designs. Um, we can help with getting planning consent for it, marketing it to the market. So there's loads we can do in terms of that. And I think, you know, cer certainly something that, that can be done to, to remove that as a barrier um, to move forward. Um, commitment to the scheme. I think this is an important one in terms of, um, Moving a scheme forward, as I say, yeah, timeline, I think 18 months um, to, you know, to, to get to a scheme probably to site and then you know, 12 months to build it probably. I'd love to say we could do it quicker. Um, and I think yeah, we have done them quicker. It comes down to commitment. I think you know, one thing I say to my team is somebody on the NHS side needs to want this thing more than us. Um, we, we can put all our sweat asset into trying to get a development going and we've got loads of you know, challenges with you know, planning, design building regs, all of that good stuff. Um, but fundamentally, uh, getting um, it through the business case and those first four boxes of my development process is the biggest challenge. And I think if we can get a, a really fully committed team um, that, that that's, you know, sits around a table or a virtual table, but preferably a table you know, regularly, then definitely that moves forward um, much, much quicker. Um, estates expertise, I think I touched on this earlier. Um, ICBs don't have um, from my experience, the level of people, um, and that's not a criticism at all, it's the way that the NHS is now structured, um, to potentially you know, have the bandwidth um, to, to, to spend the time on some of these projects. So whilst I'm saying I want commitment, um, I am very aware that you know, the expertise and the bandwidth isn't always there. So I think um, you know, reaching out to consultants like ourselves, you know, we, we can, um, sounds a bit sales pitchy, so sorry about that, but I think it's genuine in terms of you know, authoring business cases, you know, going through appraisals, looking at that financial modelling in terms of how is that how is that rent spread? Where when does the rent kick in? And actually looking at it from a very practical position of what can be done. Um, I think if we if we can definitely help in terms of um, looking at that, and I think picking up some of the the hidden costs, you know, the SDLT, um, the FF and E costs, the IT costs, things that aren't necessarily rolled into the rent um, fixtures and fittings, removals, all of that, all of that stuff. Um, and you know, development expertise. You know, development is it's it's tricky. I've got to be honest. It's um it's something that um, I think it's more and more difficult. You know, year by year, I think the hurdles get higher. Um, to get more of them in in the race and you know, getting over them all um, and getting to the end. It, we definitely um, get a sense of um, satisfaction when we get a scheme to site. I think you know it's it's, it's a long battle um, going forward. And I think um, for me, definitely working with the right team, be that um, the financial team, the the the, the design team, etc. You end up with a product that that. Um, if you've been committed to it, you're the product that you absolutely want and and will get. You know, want it, um, you'll get exactly what you need. Um, and and yeah, we we know is that we can deliver. I think you know, having delivered things through COVID and with contractors that go bust, we 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 we're happy with that. I think when when we did the Starport scheme, interestingly, the GPs decided you know we might do this ourselves. Um, and then uh, yeah, we presented to them and said actually we we want to do it with you. And I think the best thing that happened for me at the end was 
you know, a lot of the GP partners, we had a, a meeting at the end and they said, you know what, we've all talked about, we're so glad we didn't try to do this ourselves, um, which was, which was uh, you know, as, as good a testament as I think you could get. So um, I'm conscious of the time. I've kind of talked quite quickly, but I want to leave some time for questions. Um, so I think that's kind of a wrap up. I think in terms of takeaways, I've put stuff there, but I wonder whether I just pause now just to give my voice a break and everyone a break from it um, and pass back to you, Tamsin. Thanks, Ian. I think you've probably explained things so well that nobody had any questions because there's no questions in the <laughs> chat. Um, but conscious that some people might have um, more broad questions that may want to put their hands up and come in at all. So I want to give people an opportunity. Feel free to come in. I can't see it. Oh, Bob. Yeah, I'm just I'm an architect, <laughs> so okay. I, I have to I have to pick up on on uh, your comment because it, it's something that we're so used to. Um, and I, I just want to I want to understand properly how you measure. What. Sort of quality. Um, uh, you talk about statement buildings and and embellishments and these these are all sort of rather intangible things mm. and what what i what i'm wary of is uh is designing something that is um is is uh to um it doesn't it doesn't value the the quality of space for the long term in terms of building in terms of place making because if you if you're building a, a well-being hub or such you want it to be attractive. You want it to be um, comfortable for people. You want it to be, uh, you know, a, a good destination as a civic place. And I, it's it, it's 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 just trying to understand uh, how that's discerned. If it's not, it, it, it tends to be a bit subjective. Uh, yeah, and, so and 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 you know, we're not we, we're not willful and profligate we we do design as carefully as we can to to keep things within budget but often then then there's a value engineering process which then dumbs things right down and makes it actually becomes a an irritation to people in the long term because it's not yep. quite good enough do you know what i mean <laughs> i do and I, and i think you know, absolutely you know there's none of our buildings that we've delivered that i wouldn't want to take somebody around and show them and I think so I think it's not about absolutely it's not about dumbing it down at all I think it's just a, a recognition that across the sector at the moment um, with bill cost increases of you know 30 35 percent you know the reality is Bob that, that that we can't go to the NHS and say therefore your rents have gone up by 30 percent it's just it's just not there and this is about how do we deliver schemes now that still deliver that clinical space um, and still are affordable um, mm. to the system and I think absolutely you're right you know the, the main thing is that we understand the cost of the scheme early on so we do our designs we cost them properly and robustly we take them through a robust business case and then you're not into value engineering if you do that properly up the front then you don't have the shocks and I think yeah. it's, it's, it's those schemes that have kind of someone's going well we'll build it for two and a half thousand pound a square meter and we'll just run through that in the appraisals yeah right. you design a lovely building that's that everyone's bought into they're clearly going to bear, um, like breast by beds so. sorry yeah. Um, no, and um, so, do you mind muting yourself? Sorry. We have to send out. I'll just carry on. Um, so, and I think it, I think it's that piece that you know, if we've if we've asked for everyone's time and commitment, as I talked about, and they've all sat around and everyone's bought into the drawings, the last thing we want to do as a developer is say tenders are back. It's a million pounds over budget, so either pay me loads more rent or we've got to value engineer it all out. I think it's about just designing it from from the outset um, and, and when I say design to cost it's making sure that the, the two match is what I'm saying I'm not saying we've dumb it down um, I'm just saying we make sure mm. we we have a clear handle on both at the same time. Mm. Ian can I add to your answer before we go to Simon if you don't mind? Of course you can yeah. Um, so so Bob so I'm involved more in the business it case end of things and I think when Ian and I were discussing some of these challenges um, it was my perspective is not necessarily about big waiting areas and lovely airy foyers. It's about assessing the GP and the services affordability in terms of ongoing revenue and service charges, which is based on per square meterage of their, not just their own demise, but shared space as well. 
So if we don't do our due diligence and finding out about what can the, the providers afford in terms of ongoing service charge on top of their rent, mm. and then design the scale according to that, we're not even going to get to the point of looking at at lovely atriums and, and foyers. So I think that's my perspective of that, of doing a bit of the number crunching early on. Yeah, so it's op operational cost really matters yeah. here as well, doesn't it? So low energy buildings, um, your passive house standards, that sort of thing can make a huge difference to that that uh, yeah. operational cost. Um, uh, yeah, and a, a, an atrium with a lofty um, volume of air that you don't really want to heat is just, is, is yeah, I can see that that would be profligate. And yeah, we try and avoid that. So yeah, yeah I'm with you. Simon. <laughs> Thanks, Tamsin, and uh, thanks, Ian. Just an observation and a question. The observation is some of the arm wrestles you can end up with with GPs who think that they're going to make a very nice return on their premises when you come along and make them an offer to move somewhere else. And we had a very good example of that many years ago at Sandwell, where even with the DV on our side, the GPs just wouldn't shift. And in the end, they stayed where they were. Uh, which was a great loss for them and a great loss for the building that we then subsequently built, which didn't have as many GPs in it as we wanted to, but that can just be unrealistic expectations, I think. I guess the question is about ICBs and their future, whether you're picking up any signals of what powers they might get going forward to take on leases. Is there any inside intel from other parties who might be looking at this? Because I guess until a general election, it might be a bit difficult to see much movement, but that would be one way of moving things forward if they are able to sign leases, because ever since the demise of the PCTs, it's been very difficult at times. Yeah, I mean, I think I think I've heard of one um, where they've done that. I think yeah, they can take leases on their own, obviously, office accommodation and the state space they you know, run their business from. Um, but I think I've heard of I think I've heard of one. I'd have to have a dig back through my emails to to see where that was. I think that would definitely solve it. It, it feels like it's a hurdle we don't need. Um, fundamentally, they're commissioning those services. Um, it's in their gift to, to say where I want you to deliver them from. Um, so why not, you know, as part, you know, and again, you know, I'm, I'm not, um, I'm not in the ICB, so they might tell me why they can't do this. But you know, to my mind, if, you know, why not just go back to the way it was in terms of PCTs where they've got that space and it's, it's in their gift to use that space as they wish you know that and that can change um, and uh, again the builders can flex to do that but it would definitely um, do that but uh, you know I've not heard anything on an inside track as to how soon that's going to that's going to happen but it definitely needs to in my opinion Thanks, and, and I was, uh, just so just one more on that and I think yeah, the, the other benefit of that is if you've got an ICB on your lease instead of a um, GP you know we can demand a, a sharper yield it's they're a stronger covenant we can we can demand, demand more, more value for it and therefore push rents down and you know there's a win-win. Did that give you what you needed Simon it's unfortunately it's not intel but um, an inclination of where the market is. Any yeah. other questions? Or comments. So, um, Ian, do you want to just quickly run us through your takeaways, um, very briefly, and then we can wrap it up. Yeah, of course. I mean, I think, yeah, as I've said, and I won't labour this now, the, the current market is difficult. Yeah, we, we're in a tough market, and I think we've got to do as much as we can to to sort of um make make things work. I think CDL, um, you know, it's it's might not be that familiar to everybody, but once you've got a trust or an NHS body involved, just make sure you ask the question. Um, that, that they've considered both the CDL liability and the affordability of the rent itself. Um, I think you know, getting the right team, you know, getting the right team that knows its stuff, and yeah, you know, that's architecture and everybody. So picking up on your point, Bob, you know, definitely, I we have a, you know, we go back to the same people who we know can deliver a really good product um, to the market, and I think that's that's really important. And I think you're know, making sure we understand the legal structures, making sure that our tenants understand the legal structures. If we're going to talk about an income strip product, for example, where we know it needs a 40 year lease because and the trust wants to own it and we've done one of these down in Edenbridge last year um 
well, what happens with the subtenants if if the head tenant, you know, have have they talked to the GPs and said, do you realise I'm signing up to 40 years to keep this affordable? You're going to have to do the same if it has to be coterminous, and uh, you know, CDEL will demand that because you know GPs aren't liable to CDEL, so trust will look to offset their liability by the subtenants, but they have to be on the same terms. So just making sure that the legal structure is fully considered at the outset, I think, is is make sure you don't end up with a a hurdle that you've got to jump later on when you've gone too far down the design line. Um, and I, th you know, I think the other one I'll just I will touch on it again is just measuring the scheme benefits. This you know this isn't about buildings; it's about clinical services, and it's about making sure you know we as patients, you know, we all we all moan about the eight o'clock phone call to try and get a GP appointment and sitting in a queue. Um, and you know I was with GPs up in the north, won't say where, that were saying you know we need forty percent more space. You know we'll employ more GPs; they just don't have the the space to sit them in. Um, unfortunately, their ICB was also one of those that says yes, it's really important, top of our list, but we've got no money. So it's that kind of catch twenty two. But I think you know, I think if everybody looks at this, the benefits realization, and actually why are we doing this? It's not so that you know me and my team can be a developer. It's because the system needs more clinical accommodations because we as patients need you know improved health care and primary care. You know, is, is as it says, is primary to it. So I think you know making sure that that gets that gets measured. Um, you know, you look at the um, the green book, which is the business case. Um, um, Bible effectively for us. You know, if you look at that, that has a definition of value for money, and it talks about the whole system benefit. Um, it doesn't talk about what's the rent. Um, and district valuers unfortunately start with that and say, well, this is val not value for money because it's over two hundred and twenty pounds a square meter or whatever. You know, the green book itself talks about it's about delivering the system requirements. That's what value for money is, and I think we've got to get better at measuring that and and singing about it once we've done it. Um, for sure. Is that enough, Tamsin? Thanks, Ian. That's perfect. Um, so thanks, Jane. Um, I'd like to just take this opportunity to let people know that on Thursday we've got another session. I know a lot of um, people on the call today have already signed up for, for Thursday's session. So on Thursday we are we're going to be talking about the Wood Green CDC, which is a CDC and a shopping centre in London. Um, and the, the lessons learned there will be shared by Jonathan Wilson, who was the technical lead of the project. And we've got Andrea Craig from uh, the Trust from Whittington Health. Uh, so I think it'll be a really lovely balanced view of what were the technical challenges of putting in a, a CDC into a retail environment, as well as hearing from the, the client side. So please do let me know if you'd like to join that. And then lastly, thank you all for joining. If there are questions that occur to you after you've dialed off, as I said in the beginning, please don't hesitate to, to pop me an email. I'll pass it on to Ian if it's a, a technical question that I can't um, help with. But thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.